let us come back to the uh, uh, suttas again. So today, the next couple of days, uh, uh, the emphasis is going to be a little bit more uh, on meditation than it was uh, for the weekend. And for that reason, uh, I intend to look at the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, first of all. So the, on the weekend we looked at the first Noble Truth, uh, now I want to look at the fourth Noble Truth, uh, which is about the path, and then we can move on to uh, the second and the third Noble Truth uh, at a later point. So this is uh, what we're going to do, and uh, just to remind you of the fourth Noble Truth, this is what it sounds like. Yeah all about the practice. Now this is the noble truth of the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering here. It is simply this noble eightfold path uh, that is right view, right thought or right intention or right aim, right speech, right action, uh, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right immersion. Uh. So this is just the standard description of the Noble Eightfold Path that you find in the Four Noble Truths. Now, the <coughs> Noble Eightfold Path has many different ways of thinking about it and uh, looking at it. Uh, you can see it from many different angles. Uh, and one of the things that is interesting about the suttas, uh, uh, is, is it a bit funny sound in the loudspeaker? Uh, or is, it is it okay for you? Uh, okay, this sounds a bit funny for my position. Okay, so one of the um, one of the things about the uh, suttas uh, is that almost everything in the suttas uh, is about practice. It's a very pra practical, pragmatic path. It's about how to move from A to B. Uh, theory is not so important, except if the theory supports the practice. That's the only theory that really matters. Uh, but the Buddha's job is not to lay out some kind of philosophical system or anything like that. Uh, the Buddha's purpose is always to help you to move away from dukkha and achieve something, uh, an elimination of suffering in the world. Uh, and the, so the Buddha's really is about compassion. Uh, yeah, and the wisdom aspect merges in with that compassion. And that is the point of it. Uh, so the Noble Eightfold Path is only one way of presenting this path. There are many other ways. Uh, and this next sutta we're going to have a look at uh, the Chanki Sutta is also about the practice in a sense, uh, but it is looked at from a slightly different angle. It gives an overview of the entire path, uh, but from a slightly different point of view. Uh, and that I think is why it is interesting in a sense. So uh, this is found in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, middle length sayings of the Buddha, uh, number 90 five, the Chanki Sutta, on page 18 in your little booklet if you want to follow along here. And this is how it goes. By the way, this Chanki Sutta is named after Chanki. Chanki is a, was a Brahmin at the time of the Buddha. He was one of the uh, powerful Brahmins uh, in the, the Korsalan kingdom. Uh, and uh, uh, so he uh, here the Buddha comes to his village and uh, basically they have a conversation. This is what happens uh, when he comes there. Huh? Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Korsalan country huh, with a large Sangha of bhikkhus. Uh, and eventually he arrived at the Korsalan Brahmin village named Upasada. There the Blessed One stayed in the God's Grove. Uh, the Sala tree grove to the north of Opasada. So this is uh, one of the things that you see, especially in the early days of Buddhism, uh, when the Buddha started out soon afterwards, uh, he would wander around yeah, from place to place uh, and teach, uh, find people who were interested in, in uh, spiritual matters, and that would be almost everyone. Uh, in India, everyone was interested in spirituality, pretty much. Uh, and if you go to India today, you get that feeling of this country where spiritual matters are really considered of great significance. Uh, yeah, everyone has their little gods, everyone has a guru, and there's all kind of var large variety of different teachings. Uh, India is this hodgepodge of spiritual teachings. Uh, very dif different from most other societies in the world, the Indian society. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things that makes it slightly interesting to go to India. It's a diff very different culture from most other places. Uh, so he's walking around with this large Sangha of uh, monks and then he arrives at this uh, place, this Brahmin village, uh, and staying in the God's Grove. 
sounds very auspicious. God's Grove, Deva, Deva Vana. Yeah, it's the kind of the, the name here. So maybe the gods are hanging out as well. Uh, they get to hear some good Dhamma. The gods also need to hear Dhamma, not just humans. Uh, we all need Dhamma. Just because you're a god doesn't mean you haven't got any delusion, uh, unfortunately. Uh. So this is what happens then. Uh. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki uh, was ruling over Opasada, a crown property abounding in living beings. Uh, rich in grasslands, woodlands, waterways, and grain, a royal endowment, a sacred grant given to him by King Pasenadi of Kosala. So this gives you a little bit of background of how society was structured at that time. You had the king at the top of society. Not all countries were, uh, were um, monarchies in this way, but there were a few monarchies in the north of India. The countries were quite large at this time. I don't know how large Kosala would be, but it probably be uh, the size of Malaysia at least, maybe larger uh, yeah, in terms of area, so quite large uh, countries. And uh, at this time it was the uh, Kshatriyas, the, the aristocrats were still the highest caste and later on the Brahmins uh, became the higher caste. But already at this point you can see how the Brahmins were considered important uh, because they were like the, uh, the, the priests of the time. Yeah, these were the important uh, priestly caste and for that reason they would be given property by the king and they would live off that property. Uh, and you can see here it was a very wealthy property. Yeah, they had all these grasslands and all of these kind of things and the whole village almost belonged to these Brahmins uh, and all the beings there, the, probably the people as well, at those, in those days they still had slaves, yeah, so probably slaves also that uh, uh, belonged to this particular Brahmin Chanki. Yeah. The Brahmin householders of Opasada heard the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans who went forth from the Sakyan clan uh, has been wandering in the country of the Kosalans uh, with a large Sangha of bhikkhus, 500 bhikkhus. Uh, and then there's a lot of intervening matter, we'll just cut that out. Uh, now a good report of Master Gautama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, uh, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of the worlds, uh, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, uh, awakened and blessed. So uh, this paragraph here is a very important paragraph actually uh, and uh, this is a paragraph you see in so many places in the suttas, uh, the very famous Itipiso paragraph. Yeah, if you recollect the Buddha, you say Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddha Vijja Charana Sampanno, etc. Uh, that is that paragraph there. Uh, and the reason why this is so important is that one of the ways of giving rise to a kind of enthusiastic, uh, positive feeling about, you know, in meditation practice uh, is to recall the Buddha. And how should we recall the Buddha? Well, you are allowed to be a little bit creative, but this is how the Buddha suggests we should recall the Buddha. Yeah? <laughs> this is not the Buddha. This is how you should recall me, says the Buddha. These are the factors that really matter. Yeah? These are the important things. And so for this reason, it is quite useful to reflect a little bit on this and to know how the Buddha thinks that we should recall the Buddha. What are the really important, significant qualities of a Buddha? And uh, the answer, what is interesting about this, is that the focus here is very pragmatic. It's very much about those qualities, that he is a teacher, that he has the wisdom, he has the ability to teach. That's what you see here. There's nothing here about psychic powers. Yeah? Even though the whole world, even today, is interested in psychic powers. Is anyone here interested in psychic powers? <laughs> It's kind of cool, it's hard not to be interested, right? If you hear about psychic powers, it kind of get draws you in. How can you avoid being <laughs> interested in psychic powers? But the Buddha doesn't say that this is important. Actually, it's not really re talked about at all. Yeah, psychic powers is kind of irrelevant. Uh, whether you can fly through the air or read someone's mind, maybe you can do those things, but you know, according to the suit, as you can, actually it doesn't really matter. Uh, this is not what Buddhism is about. Uh, and be very careful with that because uh, it is easy to get drawn into these things as if they are really important. 
But, uh, and when you read the sutta, sometimes you may see places where psychic powers seem to be described, where the Buddha seems to have some kind of psychic power, but the most unreliable of all the passages in the suttas, or among the most unreliable, are those that deal with psychic powers. Uh, when you do your comparative study, you compare the suttas across various traditions, you find that, that those are actually some of the unreliable ones. Uh, Generally speaking, the Buddha does not display psychic powers. Uh, yeah, he doesn't do these things, and for good reasons. Well, one of the reasons is he lays down a rule like, for the monks, against the monks or the nuns, from displaying such psychic powers. And it would be a bit hypocritical if he then went around doing the same thing himself. He has to live by example. Yeah, even the Buddha has to live by example. Uh, so that is missing. Yeah, uh, that is kind of very interesting. Yeah, also. Nothing really there about the Buddha, who he is as a person, apart from spiritual qualities. Uh, all you see here are spiritual qualities. Uh, let's just have a quick look at it, because it's actually it's very, it's very, uh, these passages are very significant, precisely because, you know, if you think about them in the right way, they do give rise to that sense of enthusiasm and, and, and gladness that you that you have, we all have a teacher that who is so remarkable, it's kind of astonishing. Yeah. So, it accomplished, yeah, fully awakened, uh, accomplished here is Arahant, uh, fully awakened Sama Sambuddha, uh, these are kind of standard words, uh, yeah, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, uh, Vidja Charana Sampano, uh, and uh, what does this mean? Well, it means in true knowledge, uh, it's here the vidya, uh, uh, it is the kind of knowledge that uh, has an insight into the nature of reality, the nature of the world, the nature of the mind, what it means to be a human being. Yeah? Uh, the Brahmins had this idea of te vidya, three knowledges uh, that were the Brahmanical idea about this. So the Buddha counters, well actually the knowledges you have uh, may not be the final word. This is actually more profound, this is more interesting, because yeah? this says something about the nature of the world, the nature of the human mind, what happens to human beings as we live, etc. That's why it's interesting. Yeah? So what are they? Well, Tevijja typically in the suttas are yeah, the idea of rebirth, kamaha, and arahatship, the destruction of the asavas and the attainment of uh, arahatship. These are the three knowledges, or you can call it the three insights, if you like. Yeah? These are real insights. These are understandings of reality. That's why they are insights. Uh, there are many words in the sutta as you could translate with insight. Typically the word vipassana is translated as insight. But uh, I, I once discussed this with Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and I said to Bhikkhu Bodhi, I'm not sure if uh, insight is a good translation for vipassana because if you look at how it is used in the sutta, uh, vipassana is something that leads to panya, it leads to wisdom, and wisdom is really insight. Uh, so vipassana should probably be translated as something like clear seeing, yeah? If you see the, uh, how Vipassi, Vipassi, one of the past Buddhas, how Vipassi is described in the suttas. He's described as someone who sees clearly. That's why it's called Vipassi, yeah? He has no kind of uh, hindrances. He sees very clearly what is going on. That is his, uh, uh, he doesn't have any insight yet. He's not yet the Buddha, but he sees clearly, yeah? So that seems to be a better translation. So I said this to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, and I said, yeah, you're probably right, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to change my translation, because it has now been so ingrained. This is what everyone is used to, so I can't change it now. That was his argument. <laughs> so there you are. Yeah, so this is what happens sometimes. But uh, fair enough. You can't really uh, you know, argue with this. But So Vidya here actually is a very good candidate for translating with insight. These are the real insights into Buddhism. Rebirth, Kama, and awakening. Yeah, and when you look at these three things in the suttas, how they are described, they are put almost on the same level with each other. They are really elevated very highly. And I always like to point out when you see the breakthrough to these three vidyas in the suttas, uh, each one of them is called like the turning on of the light. Yeah, you're moving around in darkness. One day you see this, the light goes on. Oh, 
This is what the world is like. Jeepers, I had no idea. If you are in the dark, you don't know which way to go. You don't know where the path is. You don't know if there's something that you might hit your head into. There's a lot of dukkha if you have no lights. Yeah, that's why we turn on the lights here. I tried to walk up the stairs to the roof the other day like, without light. And sure enough, halfway up there was this big shelf coming out of the wall. I didn't see. Bang! <laughs> I, I hit this with my head. Yeah, darkness is always bad news. You always hurt yourself if it's too dark. So next time I was kind of a bit more fumbling around a bit more and I got up there safely. But uh, So um, darkness is bad news. Light is what makes it possible to see what is there. This is the turning on of the light when you see rebirth. Having faith in rebirth is one thing, seeing it uh, is something very different, uh, far more powerful. Uh, and that is one of these similes. The other one, which is also, which I always like to point out as well, is that the simile for seeing rebirth is like the chick in the egg. Yeah? I, 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 I usually always mention this when I do talk about these retreats, and, uh, because this is also very fascinating. What, is hap what happens when a chick, a little chicken, comes out of the egg? Well, what happens is that when you are in the egg, yeah, a chick, the world is so small. All you can see is a little shell around you, you can't see very far, it's like everything is very close. You can't really see what is going on. And then one day, you use your little beak and the little claws, and you come out of that eggshell, and the world is transformed so radically from being inside the egg to suddenly being outside. Talk about transformation, yeah, suddenly, wow! This is what the world is like. Gee, so many beings, so many people. Help, I want to go back into the egg again. It's too scary out there in this world. Uh, and that is what seeing a rebirth is like. It's like being in this one little life. All we see is this one life. You have no idea what samsara really is like. No idea of other possible rebirths. And one day we break out of that eggshell uh, and then you see the world, what, for what it actually is. Whoa. That is kind of the idea. This is what insight does to you. Yeah, it really uh, radically alters your understanding of existence. Uh, this is how important these things are. They are really fundamental. Then you have the same thing for the idea of kamma, turning on the light, breaking out of the eggshell. And then the last one is when you become an arahant, when you give up all the asavas uh, and you li leave all the defilements behind. That also is like turning on the light and breaking out of the eggshell. Huh? So these three things uh, are similar, they are explained in a similar kind of way. So that's how important these three things actually are. Huh? So fundamental things, yeah, just to, I was just talking uh, very briefly yesterday about uh, the importance of rebirth, uh, and there you are. This is how significant it is, according to the suttas. Super duper significant. Uh, not just super significant, super duper significant. Uh. So this is what the Buddha sees, vidya chadana sampano. Uh, this is one way of thinking about vidya. You can also think about vidya in terms of seeing the Four Noble Truths. You can think about this in many different ways, uh, but this is one kind of the traditional way. Uh. And the other thing which the Buddha is endowed with, which is very interesting also in connection with the sutta that we have now, is charana. Charana means like conduct or behavior. Yeah? So once you have that insight into reality, it alters your behavior. It's not like you carry on as before. Yeah, if you, if you go on the internet, uh, you may see, or I don't know if you've seen this on the internet, but there are certain people out there, kind of, cons you know, a little bit conce really conceited people, and they have on their website, they have the name, and then they have Arahant next to it. Uh, have you seen that? Uh, there's some <laughs> Arahant, Arah me, me, Arahant, so and so, yeah? Okay, I'm an Arahant, and now, sorry, I've got to go off to work now, so yeah, so see, see you later. Yeah. These are kind of the modern, modern day Arahants, yeah? yeah? They are different from the Arahants at the time of the Buddha, they have changed. So these arahants, do you trust those arahants? Maybe not. These are kind of what I would call pseudo-arahants. They're not really arahants at all. They had maybe s some of these people who call themselves arahants. The reason they do that uh, is because they have some kind of experience in meditation. Yeah, They don't really understand what it is. They don't have a teacher. They have no one to check with. So they think, yeah, this must be arahantship. Yeah, this was really cool. I felt a lot of bliss and happiness. Must be arahantship. Don't really know what it is, but I'll, I'll just say it's arahant. Uh, and so they, so they become arahants and they put that on their website, like a 
Mr. So and so, it's Arahant so and so. Uh, yeah, that's what it, <laughs> what it comes down to. But uh, you see that in those cases, they still continue to live in the house. They still have their spouse. They still live an ordinary family life. They still go to work. Yeah. <laughs> so nothing has really changed. But the point is that if you do become a Buddha, if you do become a Buddha, charana conduct is changed. The fact that your inner psycho psychology is revolutionized and completely different from what it was before. It affects your conduct. If you don't have any defilements anymore, you won't display any defilements e externally. Yeah? How can you behave in an angry way if you have no anger? Actually, all you have is metta and compassion if you have no anger. How can you be cruel or oppressive if you, all you have is compassion? You don't have that cruelty and oppressiveness inside. How can you be greedy? How can you want a fleet of Rolls Royces if you have no greed? Some of those scallywag <laughs> out there, uh, you know, um, spiritual people, uh, yeah, who claim to be really advanced, uh, they have a fleet of fleet of Rolls Royces, uh, yeah. And uh, the what what is the what is the excuse? Uh, the excuse is I am so detached. I'm not even attached to detachment. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not at attached to detachment, which means I can have as much as I want, yeah, because I'm not attached to that. I can just kind of enjoy myself. Kind of madness. But this is the excuse for some of the spiritual people. That was a famous saying by uh, Osho. You know Osho? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this spiritual, this scallywag spiritual uh, guru from, uh, from India originally. Yeah. And he moved to the United States and he had a large following there and all these kind of things. There was a movie or a series, television series made of him, uh, um, which was shown on Netflix. Is that, is that right? Uh, have anyone s seen that? Uh, yeah? Anyway, so if you want to see that, you can s get an idea what some of these gurus are up to if you have a look at a television series. Uh. So, but the conduct comes out of this. Yeah? If you are a real, the real deal, your conduct will be changed uh, because you're no longer capable of acting on those defilements. Uh, you will always have a consistent conduct. And this is one of the things that we, have, we look for. This is a way to help us navigate the spiritual terrain, uh, to know which teachers are reliable, which ones are not, which, which ones are the ones that are consistently kind, uh, consistently friendly, consistently not greedy, consistent clarity. Uh, that's what you should look for. It's difficult as a layperson to see this because you don't have such close contact with monastics. Uh, so you have to kind of make the best out of it, yeah, to look uh, to the best of your ability. It's hard to be 100% sure, so be a bit humble about it. Don't take absolute positions, uh, but it will guide you to some extent to decide what, who is worthy of uh, faith and who is not. Uh. And of course, the nice thing about the Buddha in the Vimangsaka Sutta in the Majjhimanikaya 47, uh, uh, he says, you know, your job as a disciple is to investigate me. Uh. You should look at me. Do I have any of these qualities? Uh, and if I do, you, should ha you shouldn't have faith in me. He doesn't actually say, put it that way. He says, if I have these good qualities, then that is a basis for faith. So this is the beautiful thing about this. There is no such thing as crazy wisdom in early Buddhism. Crazy wisdom is a later development. Uh, not doesn't come from the earliest times. Uh, so no crazy wisdom. Isn't that good news? Uh, that's good news, because otherwise you don't know what to, what to where to place your confidence in this world. Uh. So, uh, <coughs> perfect in true knowledge and conduct. Uh, yeah, these two things going together. Uh, sublime, which is here the sugato, li literally gone well, gone to a good destination, like sugate is gone to a good destination. So this is like someone who is uh, gone to happiness, maybe you could call it the happy one might be uh, a way, but maybe that's a bit trivial, but uh, still the happy one would be probably not be too wrong. Uh, Knower of the worlds, yeah, loka vidu. What does that mean? Well, it, what it means really is that you know all potential suffering and happiness in the world. That is what makes the Buddha a Buddha, because to be able to decide whether you should give everything up or not, you have to know whether something is happiness or suffering or somewhere in between. And when you understand the full range of happiness and suffering, when you understand whether it is impermanent or not, yeah, whether it can be attained and ho held on to and all of these kind of things, then you can make a decision whether you should give it all up, whether it's a good idea to become enlightened and just make everything cease. Yeah? That is the question. 
So the Buddha, to be able to have that answer, he needs to have a thorough understanding of samsaric existence, all the various kinds of existence you can have, from the bottom to the top, how long they last, whether they can be made permanent or not. Yeah? All of these things is a necessary uh, prerequisite for, for uh, the Buddha knowledge. And when you understand that all of this, everything in the world, wherever it is, all of that is kind of unreliable, uncertain, can't really trust it, then, of course, awakening becomes the answer to that problem. Uh, suffering is always an aspect of samsara. Once you see that, then awakening makes sense. So the idea of loka vidu is uh, an important one. <coughs> so all of these things point to the knowledge of the Buddha, yeah? the fact that he has this insight, this wisdom about things. Uh, and because he has this insight into these things, he becomes the incomparable leaders of tameable people. People who are tameable are the ones who kind of are interested in spiritual life, yeah? who take an interest in this path. If you are not interested in the spiritual path, you are not tameable. You are like a wild animal, uh, roaming around, trying to find sensual pleasures here and there, but there's not much chance for you to kind of get out of that, uh, because you don't have that interest. Uh. So he's the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. The reason is because he has the incomparable insight. Uh, yeah? The Buddha is kind of very special in this way. There is, uh, he is, uh, you know, from a Buddhist point of view, the greatest spiritual genius in recorded history. There's nobody like the Buddha out there. The one thing that makes the Buddha special, you know, straight away, is the fact that he saw non-self to the very root. This is what makes the Buddha special. Almost all other religions have this idea of God somewhere in them. Buddhism is the only one where there's no creator God. And that creator God and that sense of self is the same thing, is the feeling that there is an essence in the universe. Yeah, so he, this highest, he has the highest insight, and because of that highest insight, uh, with that insight comes the insight of the path. Uh, the Four Noble Truths are always understood together. Uh, when you have that insight, you can see what took you to that insight, because you see the mind, the, you understand the kind of mind that is required to have that insight, uh, then you also understand what takes you to have that kind of mind. Uh, yeah? You need a very, very pure mind, okay? So you need to practice the path of purification. That's how you purify the mind. Without that pure mind, you can't have that insight. What is the path of purification? It's not the Visuddhimagga. Yeah, it's not the Visuddhimagga, right? Because the Visuddhimagga was written long time after the Buddha. The path of purification is Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, that's the path of purification. Uh, and that's what we have here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, the Buddha. Uh, so uh, try, try to, sometimes it can be useful to, uh, there's many ways of thinking about the Buddha that kind of makes the Buddha uh, more approachable because sometimes we can put the Buddha on too much of a pedestal. Uh, and if you put the Buddha on, maybe not too much, but on the wrong kind of pedestal, if you put the Buddha on the wrong kind of pedestal, uh, it tends to destroy our ability to relate to his teachings. Yeah, the wrong pedestal is the God pedestal. The Buddha is not a God. So sometimes, if you look at the history of Buddhism, they have moved the Buddha from the human pedestal and they have moved him over to the God pedestal. Huh? Yeah, the Buddha, kind of, the Buddha becomes like the kind of this essential consciousness of the universe, or the Dhammakaya, and all these kind of things. And he becomes something beyond what we are. He becomes something more. And how can you relate to something which is more? In the suttas, the Buddha always talks about his own practice, what he did to become an arahant. And the reason why he does that is to inspire us and tell us we should be doing the same thing. But if the Buddha is not a human being, if he is different from us, then his practice is kind of irrelevant to us. But the point is the Buddha is not. The Buddha is a human being. This is one of those very important things to understand. And if you read just this passage here, there's nothing there about the Buddha not being a human being. He is only someone who has taken the human potential to its highest. That's what he has done. So this is so, such an important thing. So when we, it's great to bow down to the Buddha because what you're bowing down to is the highest potential in, uh, in humanity. So because of that, it's a wonderful thing to bow down to, but we need to remember, still, he was a human being and not a god. Uh, 
Yeah, and then we can start to relate to his teachings in the right way. Yeah. So, um, what is it like to meet the Buddha, do you think? Yeah? You get some idea today, yeah, you can go and meet some of the great teachers in the present day. And I recently went to meet uh, uh, this uh, monk in Thailand called Ajahn Gandha. I will mention him already. Yeah. He's one of the kind of few people in the world who might be an arahant. Uh, not many left, hard to find. Uh, so if you, if you see one of them, then wow, it's like uh, you know, searching in the forest or finding a rare tiger. You have to go very gently and carefully and then kind of sneak up and then you might see them. The arahants are a bit like that, they're very hard to find. Uh, everyone thinks they have seen a tiger or seen something interesting, uh, but actually they're very difficult to discover. They're hard to discover because you don't really know who they are very often. Uh, Sometimes you have to kind of search carefully, but he has some of those characteristics that make you think he might be an arahant. Uh, so what is it like to meet a person like that? Uh, and it's kind of very interesting, uh, yeah? Because initially you feel a bit kind of, you know, you walk like this, you're not sure you know, exactly what it's going to be like. Are they going to be fierce? Are they going to be scary? What are the arahants going to be like? And the thing that you find with someone like Ajahn Ganha, He's so gentle, yeah, he's so soft, and even though you might be a, a little bit apprehensive in the beginning, yeah, it doesn't take long before you become a little bit too cheeky. So you start off being a bit careful, and after a while you become a bit too cheeky because you, you, know, you think that you can ask any kind of question from this arahant. Or maybe that's just my character, but I become a bit cheeky too quickly when I meet this arahant. So. <laughs> And because you really relax, yeah, you feel this great sense of metta. There's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, and after a while, you kind of lose that uh, little bit of that restraint that you should have uh, around somebody who is so, so wonderful. Actually, I try to be uh, really reasonably well behaved, but you know what it's like when you really relax around somebody. They become a bit like family. Yeah, you don't want to treat an arahant like your family. It becomes, <laughs> becomes a bit strange. Uh. So, and it, but it's beautiful to be around someone like that uh, because you can see the hustle and the bustle in the monastery. You see all the lay people coming there. Lots of lay people come around him. Huh? And very often he doesn't give many teachings. Uh, you sit around Ajanganha, he sits there and he looks at you, and people just kind of, oh, it's so nice to be accepted. I'm accepted by Ajanganha. I can really relax now. Usually most people, they will judge us to some extent. Yeah? Ajanganha will never judge you. Huh? So you feel really at ease. You feel really relaxed around them. And the lay people are sitting there, yeah? And then he kind of smiles and everyone laughs because he smiles, because his smile is so sweet. So it's very, you know, it's, it's a beautiful scene to kind of just behold and to be there. Yeah? And he never gets ruffled, he never gets kind of agitated at all. His temper is kind of super even, huh? yeah? And always has a smile on his face, 24-7. I don't know what happens when he sleeps, but, uh, you know, apart from that, uh, yeah, it's 24-7. Yeah? And that is so astonishing. There's that incredible consistency. And you wonder, where does that energy come from? This kind of bouncing of energy, yeah? all the time energetic. Yeah? So he said a little bit about his own practice. And he said that, well, he gets up early in the morning. Yeah? He does his meditation early in the morning. Yeah? I don't know what he does in the meditation, but it must be something really, really powerful. Yeah? <laughs> and then the rest of the day, he's kind of, he's like the sun. He kind of blares out, yeah, this can beams out the metta and the peace and all of these kind of things for the rest of the day. Yeah. Sometimes towards the end of the day he gets a bit tired, yeah? If he works really, really hard all the time, then he withdraws a little bit. Uh, next morning comes out, bang, the sun is back again. Yeah. And that is the way he has been for how long? I asked Adam Brahm, how long has he been for that? I said to Adam, because Adam Ganha came to visit our monastery in Perth back in 1988 when we were building buildings down there. Yeah. And he stayed with us for six months or something. That was before I was a monk, so it's kind of a long, uh, that would be thir over 30 years ago now. And I asked Adam, well, was it like that already then? Yes, it was already like that, said Adam said He was almost born like an, well, that's impossible. You can't be born as an Arahant. But you know, he was, from the very early time, he was like that. Uh, consistency over a period of 30 years. Okay, then you can start to kind of have a little bit of faith, yeah, when you see that over such a long period of time. Uh, and so I asked Ajahn Brahm about him, and Ajahn Brahm said, well, if there are any arahants in the world, well, that would be one of them. That's what Ajahn Brahm said. Uh, so rare, yeah, unusual, powerful. Uh, and yet, when you are with them, uh, it is so ordinary. Yeah, it is so kind of feeling, there's, not, there's nothing really kind of really special. Uh, so you're with them, you travel around, and they give you teachings, and the teachings are so simple. Uh, be kind, be gentle, uh, be generous. 
do your duties. Yeah? <laughs> that's his teaching, that's the Arahant's teaching. Yeah? Nothing about dependent origination. I'm the one who teaches about dependent origination. Yeah? That's what you do. If you're not, that's the proof you're not an Arahant if you teach dependent origination. <laughs> And it's so marvelous, yeah, it's so beautiful. He's such a simple person, but there is incredibly powerful qualities. Uh, and that is what kind of makes it so beautiful. When you listen to him tell you to be kind and to be generous, you really listen because you know it's coming from such a beautiful place. Uh, he has only your interest at heart. Uh, he's not saying this because he wants followers. Uh, you can feel that he's kind of aloof, yeah? He doesn't allow himself to, n n nobody can manipulate him. He's aloof from the people around him. You can feel there's no attachment there. Uh. He just looks at you, smiles, and then looks away and focuses on somebody else. Uh, mo one moment you exist, the next moment you don't exist anymore, as far as he's concerned. Uh. Yeah, his attention just moves moves without kind of any break, just naturally from one thing to another. There's nothing there that you feel holds on to things. Uh, there's this feeling of aloofness. Uh, you get this feeling a bit w with Ajahn Brahm as well. You don't really have ordinary friendship with someone like Ajahn Brahm. He's also kind of aloof from that kind of way of interacting with people. Uh, so it's very beautiful and I think the Buddha would have been a little bit like this, yeah, like Ajahn Ganda. I mean, the Buddha would have been even more impressive uh, because the Buddha found the way by himself. The Buddha had even more insights and powers. Yeah, he was, was different and he kind of gave us all of these teachings. Uh, but it would have been something similar, uh, yeah? So you can imagine uh, yourself. Imagine yourself in ancient India. Those of you who have been to India, imagine that you go to Kosala, or you go to Rajagaha, you go to the Vulture's Peak. Have many of you been to these places? Yes? Okay, good. Some of you have been anyway. So you go to these places and they're very inspiring places. Yeah, they are, they're very, especially things like Vulture Peak actually is really inspiring. And you sit down and the Buddha sat here. It's like hair raising almost. It gives you goosebumps. And then, so you sit there and uh, then you can think. Well, what if the Buddha was here? What if the Buddha was this monk sitting next to you? Yeah, so you come up to the vulture peak and the Buddha is there and you feel a bit frightened perhaps, just like with Ajahn Ganna. You feel a bit, oh, well, the, the Buddha, he has a big <laughs> reputation. Yeah, okay, so I better be careful what I do. So you go up to the Buddha, but then as you approach him, you get the similar kind of feeling as you get with Ajahn Ganna. He's just peaceful. He's just kind. He just has this beautiful metta about him and compassion. Uh, and very quickly you understand this person is not going to do anything harm to you at all. Uh. And you look at the Buddha, he looks just like an ordinary monk. Yeah, He doesn't look like anything special. Uh. He's this ordinary man uh, except that he has a demeanor about him that is utterly peaceful and quiet. Uh. Apart from that, uh, he just looks like an ordinary monk. There's nothing special about him. Uh. He doesn't have this kind of weird things that the Buddha statues have, yeah, this kind of thing on the head, and that he doesn't have that at all, he just looks like an ordinary person. Huh? And uh, so then you, because you feel the power of his presence, then you sit down, yeah? And then you feel a bit embarrassed because you are in the presence of the Buddha and your question is so silly, yeah? Oh, um, you know, I have a problem with my husband or wife, yeah, what should I do? <laughs> This is the biggest spiritual genius in the world. And you ask a question about your husband and the wife. What? And maybe somebody, get out of here. Of course he doesn't say that. Yeah? He doesn't say that at all. Uh, he, is, uh, he has uh, so much time for you. Uh, and he gives you an answer, a simple answer. Yeah? A very simple answer. It's something like, be kind. Yeah? Don't allow yourself to be distracted by these things. Life is suffering. Be kind regardless. Uh, that is your job. That is what you have to do. Something like that. I don't know. I have no idea what the Buddha would say, but it would all depend on the context. But it would be simple, just like Ajahn Ganha's teachings. The majority of his teachings are so simple. So you listen to that simple teaching and you really take it on board because where it is coming from, it becomes very powerful. You think, wow, this is the Buddha. So when you read the suttas, that's how you should read them. You should remember that they come from something very, very powerful like that. Uh, and when you remember that, you take them on board in a different way. They become more alive. They become like, wow, this is coming from something very strong and very profound, very deep, very peaceful, very beautiful with lots of metta and compassion. I really should listen to this. Uh, so you listen to the Buddha, and then after you have listened to him, uh, 
you now you start to feel a lot of faith and confidence, yeah, but even that short little thing. Yeah. So then you bow down, yeah. and you bow down to the Buddha, yeah. and maybe you have some tears in your eyes because it's such a powerful emotional moment when that happens. Yeah. So that's what you do, yeah, and then uh, you get up. Uh, and that memory of the Buddha, it stays with you for the rest of your life because of that powerful uh, experience you had. Uh. So think about the Buddha like that. Don't think about the Buddha as a god, something different. Think about him in this way, as an ordinary human being, uh, but with very special qualities. Uh. Get a feeling for what that is like by meeting people in this world who have similar kind of qualities. Uh, and as you do that, you start to understand what Buddhism is really all about uh, and where it leads you. You can start to see the end result of Buddhism uh, yeah, in these people. Uh. So this is one way of thinking about the Buddha and this is what, what it means that he is the unsurpassed teacher, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. Uh, that is one other thing that I also would like to kind of point out, which I think is also very interesting, because sometimes you may think that, well, we are not real disciples of the Buddha because he lived two and a half thousand years ago, yeah, and uh, two and a half, he, he had his disciples and we are kind of too late, yeah, we came too late to the party and now we kind of, kind of have to feed on the scraps or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, not, that's not really true. One of the things I always like to point out about the suttas is that when the Buddha starts out, he sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Yeah? In other words, he knows that once this wheel of the Dhamma is set in motion, it will travel into the world from one generation to the next one, from one country, one culture to the next one. So he knew already when he started out that this is going to be a big thing. It's going to go on for a long time. All kinds of people would be listening to these teachings, yeah? People in KL. KL didn't exist two and a half thousand years ago, but, you know, people in KL would be listening to these teachings. Uh, so he made it. Because of that, uh, he would have expressed his teachings, and this is what you find when you read them, in a universal language that everyone can understand. Uh, and this is why it is so easy for us to understand the teachings, yeah, after two and a half thousand years. Even though the culture is different, even though the time is different, still we can understand fairly easily what is going on, because they talk about universal aspects of the human condition. We all have craving, we all have these angers and delusions, we all want to find happiness in the world, yeah? At root, we are pretty much all the same. There is no difference between us, the tiny, kind of superficial differences of culture, etc., but that doesn't really matter. The m things that are really important are the same across humanity, across all beings. Uh, and the Buddha knew that, and he focused on that, and that's why these teachings are universal teachings. Uh, that's why they are so powerful. So the Buddha had, uh, had us in mind, yeah? The Buddha remembered you. Uh, he knew that there were people like us today reading his teachings. Uh, that's kind of Cool also, yeah, he remembered each one of us. Uh, we are kind of in his uh, audience when he was talking. Uh, we are part of it. Uh, so remember that too, because that too makes the suttas much more powerful when you read them. The fact that you are really, in that sense, you are a direct disciple of the Buddha, in the sense that he was thinking about us uh, when he gave these teachings. Uh. So all of these things help you to make these teachings come alive. Uh, they are not dead, they are meant precisely for people like us. Uh, and that is why they are so, uh, you know, so powerful and so useful. This is a way of making them even more powerful and useful by thinking about them in the right way, thinking about them like this. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just, just some hints, just some ideas uh, on how to reflect on this particular paragraph. Yeah, who is the Buddha? What is, it, what is he like? Yeah? Yeah? Metta, beautiful qualities, lots of wisdom, makes, makes him the ultimate teacher in the world. So, um, teacher of gods and humans, yeah? Uh, teacher of gods but basically means that it's better to believe in the Buddha than to believe in the gods, because the Buddha is a teaching the gods. So don't say that to the people of the other religions, because they might not like, <laughs> they may not want to hear that. But uh, from that's kind of the Buddhist point of view, yeah, the Buddha is the, the highest up there. And uh, these other gods, they usually come to the Buddha and say, please teach us, Master, because we, we don't understand. We are deluded as well. Uh, there is that passage in the uh, Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search, Majjhima 26, uh, that I, I think we, 
We looked at it here last year, and that is where the Buddha, after his awakening experience, uh, yeah, he thinks, yeah, it's too much. Actually, the, the Buddha wouldn't think like that, but he thinks too much hard work to teach, do all these teachings. Yeah, it's just going to lead to hassle and problems. Uh, and then Brahma Sahampati comes down, yeah, and bows down to the Buddha and says, please teach. And that is kind of the this idea of Brahma, the highest god in the Hindu universe, bows to the Buddha. That kind of sets the order straight, yeah? The Buddha on top, and the kind of all the gods come underneath. Uh, they should have a have, maybe we can make another sutta where the Christian god also comes and bows to the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and then Allah, Allah comes and bows on over there. <laughs> a modern a modern sub commentary. That's a good idea, isn't it? I never thought of that before. Okay. You get ideas when you give these talks. You see they kind of bubble up and you kind of <laughs> So now let's not do that. That would be too. That would be. I think we cause more trouble than we uh, than we really want to cause if we do that sort of stuff. Uh, so let's leave that aside. Uh. Okay, monks are pretty cheeky. I don't want to tell you what we do in the monastery because you might be shocked when you hear the things we say in the monastery. But now you. you <laughs> okay. Teachers of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. So that is the uh, Buddha arising, yeah, wh what it means to be a Buddha, and uh, that is how you can think about the Buddha when you do the chanting of Iti Piso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddha, etc. Yeah. Then, once the Buddha has arisen, this comes next. He declares uh, this world uh, with its gods, its maras, its brahmas, uh, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, uh, with its princes and its people, uh, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. Uh, he teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. And he reveals a whole life that is utterly perfect and pure. Yeah, utterly perfect, utterly complete is better, not perfect, utterly complete. In other words, there's nothing missing, it's complete and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. So uh, once the Buddha has arisen, this is the first thing that happens always, the Buddha comes first, then comes the Dhamma, the Dhamma is a result of the Buddha. This is the declaration, yeah, the things that he declares here, he declares that this is the Dhamma, and what he declares is this world with its gods, yeah, so in other words, all of the various realms that exist, this is part of this, and the special mention here of Brahma and Mara is because these would have been high deities at the time of the Indian culture. So he declares all of these things. In other words, he has understood all of this. Again, it shows that he has an understanding beyond the ordinary that incorporates all the existing uh, religions, if you like. All of that he understands. Yeah. So uh, again, it kind of subsumes, it, it brings the Brahmanical generation within the kind of Buddhism, in a sense. That's kind of the point of this. Uh, this generation with its recluses and Brahmins. Uh, the idea is that uh, he understands the rec recluses are the Samanas. Yeah, the Samana movements, not just the Brahmins are religious seekers, but you have the Samana movement outside of society that seek truth in various different ways. Uh, at a uh, time in India there were so many different religions and sects and all kind of things. Uh, everyone's seeking things in their own way. Uh, and when the Buddha says he understands this generation with its people and uh, gods, it means that he understands all of these sects. He understands all of these teachings. He understands how they compare to reality, to real insight. Yeah, Because he understands them, he can criticize their weaknesses and applaud their strengths. Yeah, he knows where they are weak and where they are stronger. So he has this kind of insight into what you might call religion or philosophy or spiritual teachings precisely because of his own insight. And you see this throughout the suttas, the Buddha will be debating with people and he will be uh, kind of pointing out the flaws in other people's doctrines uh, yeah, uh, precisely on that basis. Uh, this is why this comes in there. Anyway, that's my take on it. Uh, which he has realized, it, it, princes and its people, but actually should be the gods and his people, not princes. Uh, and this has been changed in later translations uh, by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, 
uh, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. And that, of course, is the critical one, that uh, the teaching that he has is not a philosophical teaching, is not thought out, is not something that he has built up. The Buddha is not a philosopher. He has someone who has direct insight, who has seen the world as it actually is. That is the critical thing. And everything the Buddha teaches is based on that insight, not on speculation or anything like that. Sometimes you hear the Buddha is supposedly just took on a rebirth because it was the kind of the way people thought about the world at that time. But that goes against everything the Buddha is. Everything the Buddha is is about teaching from his own insight, not just taking on board what was part of the culture at the time. And then he teaches that Dhamma, yeah, that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. So it's good in the middle, so when you sit down on your cushion and you fe feel too much pain, then it's not good in the beginning. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it has to be enjoyable. Yeah. So Adi Kalyana, Majjima Kalyana, and Pariyosana Kalyana means good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. So it should be something which is nice all the way through. The moment you start out, it should give some benefit. It's important not to take this too far, because sometimes some restraint is required, and restraint is always a little bit painful, because you have to hold back. So it's not just bliss all the time, that was also the wrong way of understanding the path. But there should be a general ease, a general enjoyment of the Buddhist practice. Some suffering is always part of life, but that is really kind of the idea here. So from the beginning, and then even more as you come to the middle, and then eventually the highest bliss as you come to the very end of this. Uh, with the right meaning and the right phrasing. Uh, right meaning can also mean like a, a proper purpose, a proper goal. Buddhism has a real goal. It's called Nibbana, or it's called, if you like, not Nibbana, but it's called extinguishment. This is a translation of Nibbana. It is a real goal. When you get there, that's it. You are finished. There is nothing more. And you have found the meaning of life. You found everything. And of course, that is, what, else, what, what more do you want to do? You don't want to do anything more than that. So it has a real goal. In contrast, perhaps, with other religions, yes, other religions might just lead to a good rebirth, for example. A good rebirth is not a real goal, because actually, you carry on again afterwards, uh, yeah, and then you move on. So, this is the, one of the differences between Buddhism and most other philosophers. There's a real purpose and goal here. It actually takes you exactly where you want to go. You may not even understand that at the beginning, but gradually it becomes clear, this is what you really want. Uh, this is what I wanted all along, even though I didn't really understand it. Uh, and it is a final purpose and final goal. Uh. It's a real goal, and it is, has a re it, is, has a, it is expressed with a real phrasing. Uh. Yeah, the phrasing is carefully thought out. Uh, it matches the path and the goal. And when the Buddha says something, there's always a reason behind the way he says things. Uh, everything in the suttas is structured. Uh, everything comes in a certain order. Uh, yeah? Everything fits together like a beautiful pieces of a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. The jigsaw puzzle called the Dhamma, the picture called the Dhamma. What does the picture called the Dhamma look like? Uh, it's empty. There's nothing there, but still the pieces fit together. It's weird. How is that possible? Well, that's the way it is. I'm just making it up now as I go along, so I don't <laughs> know if it makes any sense. But something like that, yeah? The picture actually is empty, ultimately. And in the meantime, the Dhamma can be c considered all the teachings, all the teachings fitting together beautifully. And then giving a kind of jigsaw puzzle of teachings, everything fitting together nicely. This is how the Dhamma works. The phrasing matters. And that's why when you read the suttas, it is so interesting to read, because you, every word is said in a certain way. Everything has a certain context with everything else. And the, the idea then is to bring this out, this meaning, as much as possible. This is part of the f good fun of reading the suttas. Okay. So, uh, he reveals a holy life that is utterly complete and pure. Remember that, it is utterly complete and pure. This is a very important point, uh, because what that means, that it is utterly complete, means that there is nothing missing. You don't need to go to the Abhidhamma, you don't need to go to the Visuddhimagga, you don't need to go to anyone else to find out what the path is. Everything is there in the suttas. This is very, very useful, because it uh, 
shows us that sometimes we may be looking for answers in the wrong place. The suttas are complete. But not only are they, so they are complete, uh, but uh, there's also nothing extraneous, nothing additional in the sutta. This is what you find in the Pasadika Sutta, the Diga Nikaya 29, where the Buddha says there is nothing lacking, nor is there anything too much. This is the other side of the coin, that nothing is lacking. Here. So in other words, everything in the suttas is required. When it comes to the Noble Eightfold Path, you can't leave out Samadhi, Samma Samadhi. If you leave it out, the path is incomplete. Nor can you leave out right view, yeah, or even aspects of right view. Without that, again, the path is, inc is incomplete. So the suttas are this whole, yeah, with nothing is too much, nothing is too little. They are just what you need to be able to practice the path fully. Every aspect is there that you require for this path. And the Buddha says this in a few places. And it's perfectly pure. Yeah? In other words, it has all those aspects of purity that purifies the mind completely. And then they say, now it is good to see such arahants. I would say that's a bit of an understatement, but anyway, it is certainly true. It is good to see such arahants. So, uh, yeah, so that, that again shows you this idea of in India, how people were always looking for spiritual teaching, trying to search out, find out who the arahants in the world are. And little did they know that this time they really had found a great arahant, uh, yeah, someone really special. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to leave you on the knife's edge. What's going to happen afterwards? Uh, and we're going to see the uh, this uh, later on this afternoon. We'll be have a look at what happens when this great Buddha meets the people of this little Opasada village, uh, and we'll have a look at that in more detail. So in the meantime, I'm going to leave you to do some meditation for yourself and uh, I will be back again at four o'clock in an hour and a half and we will then continue the sutta. <laughs>